All right, folks. Hello. Thank you for coming. Uh, my name is James Berg. I'm a senior researcher uh, at EA. Um, I am going to be moderating our panel of excellent uh, industry veterans. So a lot of you folks hopefully just saw Seb's excellent talk. He filled your brain with a lot of knowledge. And now is your chance to ask for a different perspective on some of that stuff or to get more information from, from various folks. So I'm going to ask our panelists to introduce ourselves. We'll start with Melissa Boone. All right. My name is Melissa Boone, and I am a research manager at Xbox Research. Uh, I'm Matt Strait, and I'm the senior manager of UX research at Scopely. Are we just doing name and title? No, no nothing? Yeah. OK. <laughs> Jonathan Dankoff, senior manager at Warner Brothers. Keishana Gray, G-R-A-Y. It's E-Y on the screen. I'm assistant professor. That's it's my okay. bad. It's okay. Sorry. It's OK. Assistant professor at the University of Illinois at Chicago. All right. So let's expand on that a little bit. So tell us a little bit about like what you actually do, because I don't think a lot of people understand what the various folks here do. Just very quickly. Yeah, sure. So um, I manage research across a variety of different areas. So in Minecraft, I also work in accessibility research, diversity and inclusion research, um, and also Mixer and game streaming. So a couple of different areas. One or two things. <laughs> so uh, I oversee a team that uh, does research on all of our mobile games, as well as a lot of work on kind of the GM and exec strategy level to get more buy-in throughout the company. Same. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I, I have it. I work with a team. We're, we're sort of distributed. Um, half of us in Montreal, half of us in Seattle, and uh, we work on all the games under Warner Brothers umbrella. And then the, some of the games that we uh, distribute, some of the games that we publish, some of the games that we um, uh, develop internally. And then I sort of work a little bit on some games, but mostly sort of moving up into more management role. And I, I guess I'm a team of one, so you know I research um, experiences of women and people of color um, in online gaming environments and online contexts. All right, so we've got a couple pre-selected questions because a lot of these are the most common questions we get. Um, for folks that have seen this, uh, actually, how many folks here are in the GERD Discord already? Okay, most of you. If you do not know what I'm talking about, go to grux.org, G-R-U-X dot O-R-G, find the Discord, uh, if you can't find the Discord and you want to get into research, you should rethink your career path. Okay? <laughs> Join the Discord because there is a question, there is basically a channel that is this panel, but a crap load of industry veterans and a lot of new folks that are looking for more information. So make sure to check that out. And there's a lot of other resources on that site as well. It's basically but, this panel forever. Yes. 365. <laughs> yes. There was some questions of like, do we actually need this panel? And I'm like, well, I can plug the Discord. And they're like, okay, good enough. <laughs> That's a good enough reason for you to do this. It's Discord Live. Yeah, there we go. Oh. Um, and we got one new voice, because you're definitely not in our Discord yet. Not at all. Yeah. All right, so starting questions. Um, we're going to ask for fairly brief answers. And then if you folks need more in-depth answers from my panelists, please ask follow-up questions. So what advice do you have for getting into the industry? We'll just go right to left. Melissa. Um, so my advice is always networking, meeting people. I mean, obviously, that's one of the big reasons for coming to a conference like this. But um, I think the best advice I can give is how to do that, which is just build relationships with people. Talk, tell them what you do, ask what they do. Um, it's really building relationships for the future. Okay. And for folks that are watching on the live stream and you aren't here, sucks to be you. That's too bad. Come next year because you want to meet and network like that. It's really, really important. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think doing some work that's connected, uh, even if t only tangentially, and the networking part and just kind of staying on things like jobs open very kind of intermittently. And if you reach out to someone and they're like, I don't have anything right now, it doesn't mean a month from now or six months from now they won't. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I think the other thing just to, to go one level deeper on top of like the networking and the discord, there's a lot of group interaction. But I find that the the ones that I've had most valuable interactions with is after some sort of good group interaction, they'll reach out to you personally and you'll make some sort of connection. And I mean, most of us know one another and we'll ask around and we'll talk about people, it's, you know, how human beings work. And so every once in a while, I'll see that there's an opening for a junior, somebody I know, and then I send your name along with a personal recommendation for me, it'll mean a little bit more, right? And so making sure to have some sort of human level connection to another person can be really helpful if you're trying to uh, get in, get a job. And I would question your life decisions if you really wanted to get into the industry. I would ask you why. Um, <laughs> not being anti-industry or anything at all, but I'm just thinking about all the issues and problems 
that are happening, like around, you know, labor issues, contract issues, having a precarious reality, uh, being like let go at will. So there are a lot of things I think you need to consider about what your livelihood might be, what the quality of life might be, and really thinking if that's like the path for you. And also I think you networking could let you see the different kinds of avenues and paths that, that you could take. Academia, you know, for, you know, is another option. So pitch that for us. Pitch academia. Yeah, absolutely. So <clears throat> I got my PhD um, at, in a pro. It's not computer science, not engineer. It's not even traditional STEM, like at, at, at all. So my degree was in like a more of like a social justice context. Yes, social justice warrior. I think I literally got a PhD in that. Here come the trolls. That's okay. Um, but what I did, you know, I had a concentration in media, technology, and culture. So I examined, you know, like our mediated industries. I examined communication structures and communicative practices through like a justice lens and so a lot of a lot of folks thought it was weird for me to do that but I'm like hey I have an interest here you know this was back and you know, I started my research back in like 2005 and 2007 so it was a lot of stuff that wasn't there were some conversations that weren't being had so like folks like me different you know marginalized folks you know there are some conversations that we weren't a part of so I used my degree to do that to to inform you know different industry folks like hey this is what's happening to them in these spaces so it's more of like a synergistic kind of like relationship where you can work intimately with these amazing folks and you can still be a part of that you can still get invited to these kind of um, uh, industries, but I, I keep my job at the end of the day. Let's say if I mess up on Twitter, like I'm not just fired or let go. I'm at a union house, you know, UIC has a union, so I'm protected. So I look at things that are larger than that, you know, so at the end of the day, I can pay my bills too. Yeah. All right, great. Um, all right, so second question, what traits, attributes, and or experiences do you think are most important for games researchers? So I say um, creativity and persuasion. So you need to be able to be creative in the research that you do. A lot of times there's very short time periods in which to do research, um, but also persuasion because you can do the best research in the world, but if you can't convince people to believe it or to believe you, um, then it's not worth anything. Right. Matt? Uh, yeah, I'd agree with both of those and also say uh, just an attention to detail. Like, you know, you can try and learn process, but if you lack that attention to detail and you're just like randomly going to miss things in different spots every time, uh, that's just really hard to actually do good science and to have anyone be able to kind of like be a safety net or stay on top of that. Okay. Yeah, I don't, I don't particularly think there's a single trait or attribute. I think that, I think different, different teams, different organizations, different places always are looking for a different fit. They're looking to either if I've already got somebody who's super creative and really fun and really persuasive, I probably don't necessarily need a second one right away. And so I'm looking more at like a, a team composition and a structure and sort of a, a fabric of a research team that is more effective as a group. And so try to understand, you know, who you're working with, who your boss is going to be, who the other colleagues are, and how do you mesh into there? I, I, it's a very cop-out answer because I'm, I'm not saying a single trait, but I feel like there's never one thing where I'm like, that's the one. Do you have to talk about your tea? Is that now? T-shape, sure. Right. And then one of the other things that I talk about often is, is the T model, which some people might be familiar with, where most people, you have sort of a breadth of knowledge and experience in a very deep, no, uh, a depth in a certain field. And that also depends on the organization, right? And so I think certainly like the smaller the organization, the broader a T you're going to want to be. The larger the organization, I guess I, that's been my assumption, but she told me I was wrong very recently. <laughs> but some places are looking for a very deep T, right? They're looking for somebody who has masterful knowledge in one skill set or one methodology. Uh, and, and those things, you know, it's, it's trying to figure out what is the problem that you're trying to solve for the hiring manager and how can I sell the shape of my T to them so that I look like the right candidate for that particular job. And those skill sets a point of view of that as like skill sets is sort of something more holistic than like, what's the one, th should I know how to use SPSS? It's not usually the right answer in my opinion. It's more, are they looking for somebody who's good at SPSS but also good at these other nine things? Or are they looking at somebody who's really good at SPSS? And having that level of understanding of what, what you have to offer and what they're looking for, I think is much more likely to be successful as you would try to enter the job market. And I would say have the courage to do something different um, so let's say if you're a part of a team and you see something, if you have a bright idea, be courageous enough to like say that, even if it goes against what the senior folks may have been doing or what's been there all the time. Now, don't try to go and reinvent the wheel. And we heard an amazing talk earlier to make sure that you curate the knowledge first before you try to come and reinvent the wheel. But also still have the courage, you know, to kind of like push the envelope some and push against kinds of things, you know, to come and bring those new fresh ideas. All right. Um, 
All right. So flipping the question, what advice would you give to aspiring researchers about what not to do? What are some of the most common pitfalls you see in, in research candidates, people trying to get into the field? Don't try to act like you just invented something because more than likely somebody else has done it. So I know I, I know what I just said a second ago where I said come and go do innovative like kinds of things, but also do enough of your research and your homework to know that, oh, they've tried this approach before. They've tried this method before. They've done this before. So I would say do enough of your research, curating knowledge as we heard this morning. You know, make sure that you do enough of that. Okay, Johnny? Um, I think somebody's already spoken about this, but the sort of like weird tribal thing of like, if crapping on other people's work or like, I'm a, I'm a Sony guy only. Admit that that's the best console. It's like, nah, like, you know, there's a level of fanboyism that I don't think is a professional or appropriate. Yep. Um, you know, you want to be able to speak intelligently and clearly and have, I think, useful criticisms of a game, but being the guy who likes to, you know, that piece of garbage, particularly out loud on Twitter, I also find that mm. super gross. Like, we're going to look at your Twitters, by the way. When you apply for a job, I check oh, yes. everything you've ever written. And if any of it is too salty, I don't want you on my team. LinkedIn, Twitter, anything else. That's how it goes. Yeah. I don't, I'm not saying, like, don't criticize other games. Some people can do it. Some people are better than others. But I wouldn't... Don't, don't talk trash. It's not a good look. Especially when your job is kind of educated trash talking. Uh, if you ca if you retweet, if you, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Yes, and I'll extend that a little bit, uh, especially about your own projects. You are, as researchers on projects, you are going to know where all the skeletons are buried. Uh, leave those buried. It is not your job to wave those in front of the world. That's right. right. Be respectful of your team. Keep in mind that you are there to help your team, your company. Uh, you are not there to get fake internet points by complaining about stuff or throwing up rants about your team on Reddit or whatever. And we see that happen occasionally, very rarely in the industry, where someone will publicly, very publicly leave a games company uh, and like talk crap about their previous employer, not just in research. <coughs> Actually, I don't think it's ever happened in research, but in other places in the games industry. And those people are like dead. Like it is going to be very hard for anyone to trust you at that point. <coughs> Well, let me ask you a question then. So I know because professionally that that makes sense to do. But think about like some of those hidden things that we see that that kind of highlight. Oh, that was the problem with them. That's the, been the issue. That's the culture of that place. So I'm even thinking about like the folks that I can't think of a good example, but maybe Dead Island. You all remember like the code was like feminist whore kind of code and, you know, kind of like the sexism that was like embedded into like the code of like the game. So that was like a thing that may have not been good for Techland. I don't even know if they're still around anymore. But like so are there times when it's OK? Okay. Or is there a way to kind of highlight, like, say, this team is kind of toxic. This is happening. Is there ever an okay time to do that? Yeah, I think I think there's a way. I think it's it's okay, but there's a way for it. So to, for that example, I talk a lot about diversity and inclusion in games, representation of women. I get that question all the time. Like, do you think the games industry needs to be more diverse? And I'm like, yes. We've been talking about this for years, right? <laughs> yeah. But I usually flip it around to like a positive thing about like, here is what you can do to make this more diverse. We're like this was maybe not the right way to approach it, but here's a better way or here's good examples to push up what the good are rather than denigrating people who maybe didn't do as good of a job, right? And most people get the message without you having to, you know, dunk on people. Absolutely. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think there's also, uh, you know, to the question you were asking, uh, the question of like, what steps did you take ahead of time, right? Like, were you surfacing issues and trying to get, like, get mm. them fixed? Or is it just like, you know, light everything on fire as you go out the door and nobody ever calling out and canceling yeah mm -hmm. that's straight up one of my interview questions <laughs> <laughs> tell me the worst thing about your last research team and then i don't care what their answer is the real question is the follow-up of all right and how did you try to fix that mm. yeah. and then well uh i thought you just wanted me to talk trash like oh <laughs> that's not what we're here for mm -hmm. not our job mm -hmm. that makes sense yeah i think to kind of go back to the original question and what you were saying you know it's a matter of like have you actually thought through your opinions on things right mm -hmm. uh because if you go in and you're just like spouting off about whether it's the previous team, whether it's random games you've played, you know, different console systems, whatever, uh, but haven't really put a whole lot of thought behind it, then like you're not really bringing much to the table. Like you are, in fact, demonstrating that you won't bring a whole lot mm -hmm. to the table. Mm -hmm. And my addition but, to that is, have you thought about what you want? To, to go back to Kashana's question about thinking about the industry, a lot of times I'll get requests for informationals that are like, I'd love to talk to you about your career. And I'm like... Great. There's so much that I can tell. Like that could be like a whole day conversation. Do you have specific questions? What is it that you want to know? What do you want to learn more about? So that's my number one advice to like, if you're reaching out to somebody for an informational, have some specific questions that you might want to ask people. 
Okay. All right. So we had some more pre-plan questions. I'm just going to skip those because of time here. So room, bounce us some questions. Otherwise, we're just going to keep talking amongst ourselves. <clears throat> I'm curious about some of the most impactful workshops you guys have led, if any. Mm. I think everyone here is. is yeah. I mean, sorry. Yeah. So one of the one of the things that folks often ask me to to come and give a workshop on is how to do like transformative kind of methods. So like in academia, whenever I was thinking about earlier um, with the, the talk that we had, loving that circle. I'm still going back to the talk because it was so it was so amazing. But seeing you know the knowledge generation, but also seeing like the action, you don't see a lot of that like in academia, right? You know, because that's not traditionally the realm of academics, like to change the world, you know? And so I, I approach it like more from like a feminist methodology, intersectional kind of methodology to improve people's spaces and improve, um, improve lives online, right? So one of the, one of the most, um, I think, powerful and impactful workshops that I've given has been on like critical methodologies and how to do this research and how to improve people's experiences online. Mm -hmm. okay. Johnny? Uh, Mine answer's not as fancy as that. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. I mean, uh, what I would say is I, I would break out your question into two things because there are, I think, client and or developer facing workshops that can be very useful in terms of introducing UX thinking and mindsets and, and doing all that kind of work. And then again, to re-reference Randy's stuff, was the internal facing workshops where it's really your team facing inwards and sort of navel gazing and how can you increase your maturity and your impact across the organization. And so both of those are completely different focus, but they can both be ultra impactful in how you are able to uh, work with a team. Yeah, I think uh, for me, one of the workshops, uh, which was probably not set up as clearly as Randy's presentation was this morning, uh, <laughs> so was Randy just working with us. some of the teams to kind of walk through like what their development process is, what the questions are they'd really have at the various points in time, uh, and how we could help answer them, and then go back and be like, so now that you know we could get these answers, but this will take time uh, and you'll have to actually be able to act on them. Like what should our development like schedule really look like now? And just get them to kind of embrace it into uh, the kind of whole way in which they were making games. So ex expand a bit about what kind of stakeholders would be involved in that kind of process at Scopely. Uh, at Scopely in particular, so we're set up a little differently than uh, most of the other like kind of console PC space. That's why I asked. Uh, for us, so we'd have like the general manager of the game. Uh, we'd have the executive producer, who's obviously a big part of scheduling, uh, and kind of the director of roadmap, particularly in those conversations. Um, sometimes we'd have a game designer, a UX designer. Uh, we might have director of performance there, uh, and maybe the studio head from the actual like dev side. Um, but we'd get that kind of leadership team together and just walk through, like I said, you know, what what the questions are at the different points in the process, which can be all the way from the beginning of uh, what issues are even there among the player community that we should be trying to fix next because we have a lot of live services to like, okay, now we've decided this is kind of the problem. Like what really is the extent of that problem space and how does it interact with all the other systems that are there or aren't there mm -hmm. uh, to, um, you know, the obvious like usability side of like, now that we're building this thing, like, does this make sense to players? Uh, all the way through to like, once it's out there, what is the feedback? How can we iterate on this? How can we make it better? Okay. Um, but there's just questions all along the way and just making sure that we actually try to build time into like the entire process. Okay. Melissa, workshop. Yeah, so um, mine was actually a developer facing one internal. Um, I worked on a team, Minecraft Education Edition, where they do lots of classroom observation, um, which is basically naturalistic observation, which we do as researchers. So I actually led a little workshop on how to do a naturalistic observation, but stripping out all the research language and talking about it just from a mm -hmm. human standpoint. Here's how to not ask leading questions. You know, Don't tell people, no, you can't do that. Like Give them encouragement, right? And I know that it's it was one of the most impactful ones I've done because the team members remember they passed the document around that I put together, and they actually teach each other or check each other on the questions that they're asking it on site or in, in classrooms as well so it was like a nice ongoing kind of education i was able to do so doctor i want to follow up a little bit there because you said earlier um you said something really interesting to me that was it's not necessarily your job as an academic to change the world but i'm not quite sure i agree because i think a lot of what like a lot of that broader impact has to come out of academia mm -hmm. right industry is very work you know as we've heard from our panelists mm -hmm. industry is very focused on the product and the idea and what we need for our stakeholders Absolutely. so i'm wondering if you could expand a bit about on Absolutely. how do you have an impact on the broader world there so right. 
The world is your workshop. How do right? you approach that? So this is one of the, that's not, an, that's not something that I agree with. That's just something that academic, academia says, right? So when they look at like research and validity of research, triangulas, triangulation, generalizability, all that kind of stuff. You know, so it's like very scientific and systematic. Of course, we all know that, right? And so they have often said that a lot of the research that is transformative, that they often say that we're too close and too connected to the participants, right? In a way that it's not like rigorous enough, right? So they often, I often get told that, I'm too close to the folks in online and Xbox Live and places wherever they are, whatever space that they're in. Um, but it's important to have those in-depth like relationships so you can say, hey, what are your needs? What's happening to you in this space? What kinds of conversations do I need to have with stakeholders or with industry folks to say, hey, this is what's happening. They're not filling out those surveys. This is the reason that they didn't do that. So I think having that intimate connection um, is necessary, but there's a lot of folks like in academia, there are some journals that won't accept like my scholarship, which is fine because they don't see it as rigorous enough. And they call it, there's a term, it's called me search. So they're saying, hey, you're focusing like on all those women of color. You're too connected to that community to be able to have like any kind of like informed like um, assumptions about what's happening. And so I just th I think that's a garbage argument. First off, because I'm like, like if saying I none of us could do research on games because we're all gamers. It's exactly. Like exactly. It's no, like, that's oh, what I said. You're biased exactly. because you're a subject matter expert. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So I argue a lot in those <laughs> academics. That's what I do. I mean, <laughs> they, they, don't, they don't take me serious at all because I do exactly just that. But I'm, I'm with you because like if we're if we're not changing the world or improving lives and why are we doing it for yeah. you know? and if you can't do that work then who can right because right. ain't nobody else doing and who it. is exactly. yeah, who I'm is. like okay I'm like okay I'll stop yeah. doing it you got it's gotta yeah. be a white dude <laughs> right? like, it's such an absurd anyway I mean because think of real, well let's talk about that right there because think about how much cultural knowledge that's happening in these spaces that some folks might not know it would take a lot of time to understand what it means for somebody to say whatever black colloquialism or black vernacular or Spanglish or something, you have to have, have to be connected to some cultures to understand what's actually happening in those spaces, right? So um, I don't know. I don't know. I don't have an answer for that. <laughs> I don't. It's like a worst edition of mansplaining. It <laughs> Culture splaining? I don't know. That's I'm, it. That's I'm sure it. someone's got a better term. Somebody's got it. We'll find it. All right. Next question. Question over here. Yeah. It might make a little too philosophical, so You're not a junior. For this group? No. <laughs> Um, it sort of comes off Randy's talk uh, at the beginning, and uh, <laughs> that's all we're going to be talking about all day. That's all, <laughs> clearly. <laughs> Continuous name talk. Th thank yeah. you and sorry. I know. Um, uh, it, it, it's clear to me now, especially after uh, seeing Randy's talk, but also just all the recent developments in the past couple of years around team user research that we have really come onto our own as a discipline. Right? We're we're like large enough. Uh, well, we were large enough to have arguments about methodology. We're now large enough to have arguments around boundaries and disciplinary boundaries and is UX, UR, and that type of thing. So I think that's all great. We should also pat ourselves on the back for growing large enough to have those kind of conflicts because it's sort of a sign of you've made it as a discipline. Um, but I, I, my father's a mathematician, actually, and so it, it strikes me that mathematics is, is a discipline, right, that, to be frank, very, very few people care about. But we all use math, right? And so there's a difference between those two things. And I wonder if, especially when I hear some of the debates around UX versus UR, if I wonder if we are actually going to, going to get to that point where where the broader methodologies and tools that we use infiltrate enough other disciplines that the kind of boundary making that we engage in for very practical reasons in the beginning of our discipline in order to differentiate ourselves from designers or from traditional HCI or from academic games researchers uh, will actually be counterproductive. Does that make mm. my question make sense? Mm -hmm. I'm, I hope that we're already there, like that we look beyond into other disciplines and the methods that they're using. Like I don't see any reason, like my background is as a social psychologist, but I don't see any reason why I should only use social psychological, like what does that even mean? Like why not use ethnography? Why not use telemetry? Why not, I mean, why not go beyond and look at the approaches from other different areas for whatever we need to do in order to, to capture that magic, right? Like that's what, that's what games is about. So like why would we not be able to broaden beyond and we were talking about that a little bit earlier even with this conference even like bring more people in like how do we understand different approaches from different folks to get that knowledge from them so yeah i i think that we should already be there and if we're not we should definitely push that forward can, can I share my question just a moment? yeah there are two conferences this week right there's a ux conference yesterday and a ur conference today mm -hmm. so essentially my question is why is there not one conference mm -hmm. mm -hmm. boundary discipline. i like, think logistically <laughs> I mean, well, that's a very specific that. example that has a very specific. You have to organize this. Give us an answer, Joe. Uh, well, 
Yeah, not the logistics one. That one's that one's less interesting. GDC don't like us around is not a good answer. So. <laughs> I think something that's happening, um, I mean, think about like a, something that like you nurture from, from childhood or from birth, you know, you're, you're invested, you're there, you see it, it grow. And then there's one thing. So I, I agree and disagree maybe like what well, there are folks that come in and could kind of disrupt and distort what you originally created. And so I can see some protectionism of why you would want to, you know, keep your own space and keep that there. But the interdisciplinary like scholar in me is, you know, you know, I got, got a degree that was an interdisciplinary degree where I had to draw from new media studies, communication, sociology, crim criminology. Like I drew from all these different kinds of activism, you know, not even just, you know, I got outside the ivory tower too to see, hey, what's happening like on the ground. Um, so I think that, I don't think they're incompatible though. You know, I think one of the folks like who are rooted in this protectionism really want to ensure that people recognize the groundwork that was laid to create, you know, these different kinds of fields and to create these disciplines. Because there, you have folks coming in and, you know, think it, it just began in 2015, you know, think about the timeline, oh, 2015, this is where it started without realizing all the, the groundwork that, that was laid. So I think it might be some like we want some acknowledgement too. And that could like create like some of the divides. I mean, I don't know. I don't have an answer, but that, that could be part of what's happening. That's like part of the larger conversation that seems to be coming up more and more often about increasing UX maturity in organizations and growing as a discipline is essentially, in other words, let's break those boundaries, uh, tear down silos, you know, all of... All of my favorite presentations in recent history have been like Yusuf's presentation at Games UR London, where he gave a presentation about analytics, but every example he had was about analytics working with user research, analytics mm -hmm. working with uh, consumer intelligence, you know, that all of us now are starting to see more and more responsibility to branch out from, I do usability studies, to I work with my, within my organization to improve our entire offering on top of video games, uh, you know, in Anywhere that our player interacts with our brands, with our, our, our everything, we need to be working uh, at improving that because we sort of have that link between our company and the players that we work with. And so melting all that other stuff away and finding better ways to help is, I think, paramount to us growing as an industry. All right. Yeah, and part of it might also come down to uh, kind of the breadth of each of the sections of like UX versus user research. So like to give an example from Scopely, like user research aids basically everyone there in making decision making. Uh, but if you flip to like the design side, UX designers have a very specific role that is separate from game designers, that is separate from the PMs, that is separate from everyone else. Uh, and so like the Venn diagrams are not one to one of like what we cover. Uh, and so it's probably important for each to be able to have a spot to talk about like the things that are specific to theirs, uh, if they're actually going to go really in depth on it. Yeah. Question over here. Oh, question we actually have a, yeah. So let me go ahead and read that. It says, do you think that having a public Twitter in which you discuss UX issues in video games or blogging about games is valuable for someone interested in this field? And would you view this favorably? Uh, the answer is yes. It's at games. You are <laughs> Seb long runs it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that, that sounded like a joke, but no, I'm, I'm serious. That's, I mean, you can act. I think she meant like, in, as an individual, is it worthwhile to have your own? Oh, not we as a group. Should we have one that Seb runs? Which is yes. But. I, I wait. I wait <laughs> yeah. for Seb talking for me. I sound way. No, individual. I mean, I think the answer is yes, but make sure you do it properly. Like, mm -hmm. it, if you're doing if you're doing a good job, it's amazing. If you're if you're twi twittery, uh, yeah. it it could bite you in the ass. Yeah, I think Twitter is a hard like platform too, because it's, what is it, 140 characters, right? Or is it longer now? I don't know. But it's pretty short, right? So are there other modalities that you can connect it to? Are there longer form articles that you have? Like, I would say yes, but like that can't be the only thing. There's got to be some way to supplement that to show that you have the depth, right? It's not a great place for nuanced discussion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. no. So I was going to say no. Like for doing the things that we're talking about, I would absolutely say no. So let's, because anything that we've just said right now could easily open us up to I'll use the word trolls that people will come in and flood the conversation. They can co-opt an entire hashtag and co you know, take over the conversation. So it's not what we originally intended to be. Mm -hmm. So I think that's just the nature of the platform, right? You know, so it, it affords different things, but that's one of the things you got to be ready for as well. So you got to be savvy, you know, just, 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 as you said, you got to be savvy in, in your use of it. So I like to slay folks on Twitter. So I love you. <laughs> <laughs> so, but you got to know how to do it. <laughs> 
So I'm going to plug the Discord as well. Like, if you want to have those non-140 character discussions, join us on the Discord. Yeah, I guess if the point is to show that you're smart and you want to do it in a public-private place, the Discord's a good place for that, where you know, you're not at risk of upsetting somebody necessarily. It's, especially if you're in the junior track, people understand that you are making your bones as a, a baby researcher and you're trying to figure out your voice. Uh, that can be a good place to do it and get feedback that is honest and critical from more senior people that isn't just, like you said, 140 characters of salt. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, so we had a question. I was promised more arguing. I want to hear a little bit more conflict from you guys. <laughs> Look so at who we I can try to... There should have been more arguing. <laughs> hopefully I can uh, get a question to spark that. Um, so I'm just kind of interested in, you know, it's great to plug Randy again. Um, it's great to hear this kind of history, look back, and then where things are now and hopefully where we're going to keep going. But do you ever envision a land in 2025, 2030, where the term user researcher doesn't quite exist anymore because it's been... Um, morphed into other roles so that we are getting so good at our jobs that um, now designers have a little bit of user research and engineers have a little bit of user research personality so they can start catching a lot of these things that we traditionally research and capture. Melissa? No. First of all, <laughs> because I like my job and I want to keep it, but also um, because I think as technology to develops over time that there's always going to be new problems. It's our job to kind of like, I, I see our job as researchers is to learn things really fast and then teach it to other people. Right. So I feel like as technology develops over time, there will be things that the designers will always miss and that they won't see. Um, but also I think that going back to that comment about like, as our field grows and morphs and shapes, right. So like maybe we won't always be user researchers in the, in the specific sense of looking at UIs or looking right. But maybe we're thinking about experiences much more generally about, um, the sort of undefinable magic of like, what does it mean to actually play a game or have an interactive experience beyond just actual video games, but into all the other kinds of experiences that feed into that. So I don't think so. I think that what we need to do is make sure that we evolve our roles so that we can stay employed, um, but also to help people understand like the changing landscape of, of games and entertainment. And so I would like to see like on the, so this is y'all's job. I'm not, I don't want y'all to lose, I don't want anybody to lose a job, right? <laughs> but I would like to see more of this like being intentionally embedded into the design and the core, like of when an entity, you know, begins whatever it's doing, that it's thinking about these kinds of questions that you all are doing, like from, from jump, right? And not to have this, yes, I'm going to tie back to the morning talk, but I'm thinking about, think about when the research finally comes into the conversation, like, oh, this is happening, the reactionary thing, this is happening, we need, where's the research team? Come in, help fix this. If they had done it from jump, then, you know, a lot of mm -hmm. the things that we do won't, won't be, be necessary. But again, you, do, you have to ensure that they're applying, you know, ethical concerns and making sure that they're inclusive enough, you know, so that's what we are doing. So I don't see y'all going anywhere anytime soon. I don't. Yeah. I'll take a slightly different approach while still saying no to your question. Uh, <laughs> like I think the, we won't fight each other, but we're going to fight you. We will. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <That's for arguing. laughs> uh, so I, I think for me, like research is a field that's going to take some uh, expertise to be able to do. And so being like, oh, my designers will just handle it or my programmers will just handle it is uh, probably not really what's going to happen. Uh, but I think what we might see is some of the other fields should kind of collapse into us. Uh, so like, you know, at the end of the day, we should be taking data from all sources and consolidating it into an understanding of what is happening throughout the entire like user experience uh, and being able to then help others action off that. Mm -hmm. And right now there's lots of various teams that can be involved in that, whether it's like us or uh, data analytics or, uh, you know, whatever other teams, uh, your company happens to have. And I'm not sure it's actually beneficial for people to keep them all separate. Uh, so I think at some point user research will be like, and here is everything we know about the user through all these different means. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm going to add one bit too, is that garbage research looks like really good research mm. for the untrained about like to the untrained observer. So if you're in a position where like, Oh, my engineer is doing research, they're probably doing really bad research. Like if you're not consulting with an expert, if you don't have legitimate domain expertise in that area, anyone can do research. It's just more likely to be garbage if you don't have someone that's trained in that area. Can I take a minute to dunk on James and start a fight? Mm. <laughs> no, it's a real question though, I promise. I'm just waiting for the mic. I don't really I, need it. I'm down with this dunking on James thing. This sounds like fun. Yeah, okay. 
Um, so to follow on to both of these questions, a little bit Morgan's and a little bit um, yours. Um, we're a bit cute about our discipline though, right? Like we are, like we, I mean, and I don't, I mean this, I mean, I'm a guy with a PhD, I've got alphabets after my name, like we're, we're a bit self-aggrandizing, right? I, there are some things we do that are really quite simple. Um, and I mean that, and we, I'm, I'm not trying to put us down, but there are things we do that are brain dead simple at the base level. Um, but I feel like to some degree, we are a bit protectionistic about our own work. I mean, I do data analytics and we don't like when other people do that. Mm -hmm. This is a bit bizarre, and I think it's maybe, and I want to get your opinions on this. I think it's a sign of our discipline growing up. Um, you know, I was in an engineering role before, and if a designer came to me and said, no, no, you don't need to do this scripting. I've already programmed it, and it works. My knee jerk would be, sweet Jesus, this is great. Whereas here, we'd be a bit like, you touched my toy. Um, and we, we kind of, we, we play that game a lot. And I want to get your perspective on that. Like, should we be teaching designers and sound designers and artists and engineers to be doing these things from the get-go for themselves and assisting and validating and training and spreading research? Or should we be keeping it kind of like, no, 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 you wouldn't understand, which is kind of how I <laughs> tend to view it. But anyway, mm -hmm. sorry, that's the mm -hmm. long not question. I'm trying to start a fight too. I need mean, one of these times. <laughs> And then I agree with them. I'm sorry, because I think he's absolutely right. So in my approach, you know, it's like feminist methodology, intersectional methodology. I empower the folks that most people will call subjects or participants. You know, they're the co narrators in knowledge production. Like it's not me that has the information. It's them that has the information. So there's like a this back and forth kind of relationship, you know, with both of us that's empowering them to do the thing that I spent a whole bunch of money to get this PhD to do. I'm like, hey, I don't have to have it because it's, it's elitist. At the end of the day, you have to think about what the pursuits that we're doing. It's actually very elitist. We know this. I know this. You don't. We're the you know, so I, I agree with you. I know we're supposed to be arguing. I don't want to argue with you because you're right. <laughs> you're right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what? Someone else? Oh. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, uh, somebody this morning, who I won't name check for the 80th time, mentioned the importance of, you know, what do you do if, if people are using your data wrong? Um, and it, it's about growth, right? Like, part of this is growing up and teaching people and educating others. Uh, but there is, there, I mean, there, it is dead simple, but it's, there is a time-consuming element to it. There is... You know, there is a subject matter expertise, and even it, I think part of it is it also looks really simple. Clear, so you sit in a room and you watch a guy play video games. Like, what do you even? And it's like, well, no, I happen to know a lot about watching people play video games, and so it, it feels simple. Uh, I think my um, one of my colleagues, Walker, put it nicely. It's uh, simple versus complicated, or simple versus uh, I'm getting it wrong. But it was it was an eloquent way of saying like just because something. Mm -hmm. Just because you can grok it doesn't mean it's easy to do. Mm -hmm. He mentioned losing weight. Like everybody knows how to lose weight, but like, yeah. I don't. I can't really do it. Right. <laughs> yeah. And so I think that there's an element to that about uh, user research where you see a bunch of people sitting in a room and filling out a form. It's like, to be clear, I'm in certain methodologies. Okay? Sure, but Not still, I mean, right. there is still a, a subject matter expertise that is important to um, make sure that it's spreading, but. Owning it and jealously guarding it from others, I think, is the wrong path forward for all of us. Mm -hmm. That uh, sharing this knowledge and you know pushing, you know, once you have like heuristics, like Seb talks about, and getting those out into designers' hands, the UI trap cards, those things, and then, I mean, basically for us, it just lets us elevate our work, right? Because now we're not spending the first six months of integrating with a team, grabbing low-hanging fruit continuously off the tree. We can we can start from a place of like, all right, now let's do the really cool, really interesting mm -hmm. stuff. Mm -hmm but that's, all of it still needs to happen at some point, whether we're doing it or they're doing it. Yeah. That's why my answer to Lauren's question started out as like, no, but then ended up being more like, are we done? Okay, sorry. Okay, um, I'll finish it really quickly. I do agree, yes, teaching the slow level, the low level stuff so that we can do the up level, because I've noticed like once they know how to ask the questions and survey stuff, it's coming back to me and helping me, helping, me helping them put it together and interpret. Yeah. Sharing results, not necessarily methodology. Right. All right, so that's it. That is us. Uh, it for time. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Uh, feel free to that grab was any of us. Five minutes. Yeah. Wow. So feel free to grab that's any of us uh, or people time. with the uh, ask. Is it AMA? Is that what the badge looks like? Yep. The AMA. Uh, feel free to ask anyone with the blue badge. Fire these questions at them as well. This this day is all about knowledge sharing. Please continue to do that. Join us in the Discord. Thank you for your time. <laughs>